Daisy from Nevada says, I feel the angel membership is wonderful. Everything is perfectly organized and easy to use. I love that you can take things at your own pace. It's easy to catch up as well for those of us who have busy schedules. That's what we wanted. Daisy, thank you so much for being an angel member. Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back to the Angels and Awakening podcast. I'm your host and author, Julie Jancis. And today I have something very exciting for you. We have Becky Vollmer on the podcast today. She is the author of the new book, You Are Not Stuck. And friends, I don't know about you, but um, we are all making decisions within our lives. And some of those decisions are small and some of those decisions are huge and they affect other people's hearts and their lives and your own life. And so we're going to talk today about the decision making process, how you make decisions. Um, when you feel stuck making choices in life, what do you do? Um, so Becky, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. And you're having not just me, but my dog, Sadie, in the background. Sorry about that. I love it. I'm a dog person. That's all good. I'm really glad to be with you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's start off with you are pretty much the expert on making choices when it comes to this. Uh, there are people who and maybe we all go through this at a point in our lives. You have to learn how to make choices. How do you learn how to make choices? I think that's right. It's not something that we sort of come out of the chute knowing how, knowing what to do or how to do it. Um, for me, the making choices is a little bit art and a little bit science. But when we do it well, I think it's when we get out of our head space and down into our soul space and begin to make what I call soul guided choices which which means we're operating less from that place of ego and conditioning and fear and more from that place where we're really aligned with our deeper selves. So what's the beginning step that somebody takes to tune inside to their own inner wisdom? That's a great question. The The process that I outline in this book, there are nine steps. And for me, the, the first one is to get familiar with where it is in your life that you're stuck. So often, so many of us have a this sense that something is not right, something is off, something is heavy, and we just kind of can't articulate exactly what that is. But if we can drop out of the head space and more into the body space and the soul space, I think we can get a better sense of what's not working, why it's not working, how we feel about uh, the place, the area where we're stuck, and to understand our patterns of what we do when we feel that way. So then with all of that information, we can get a sense of, here's what I don't want and importantly, why I don't want it. Mm -hmm. And then we can begin looking forward to, here's what I think I might want instead. Yeah. Okay, so this is fascinating. I'm excited to have this conversation. This is the way that I see energy. You have three real different energetic spaces within your being. You have the auric field, which is the energy that kind of extends outside of you from your body, like you're a sun and those just rays of energy are extending out in every direction. You have the chakras, you have the physical body's energy. And the way that the angels talk about how things manifest and show up in your life is they start out in your auric field and they work their way in through the chakras to the physical body. But when you start at the beginning of the process, when a person's kind of thinking about what choices they want to make, they're out in this realm in their auric field where they say it's the realm of all possibilities because we have all possibilities open to us. But as I've worked with people over the years, some people can narrow it 
down and look at, well, I like this, but I don't like this. And a lot of times it's through the things that we don't like that we get to what we do want. But for some people, the energy of being in the realm of all possibilities is too overwhelming and kind of taxes their system energetically. And I've seen these people just shut down where they stall on making a decision, any decision, and then they're stalling on taking action. How do you help those folks? Mm, that's such a rich question. And I love the, the, the way you describe um, where the energy comes from. I see exactly what you describe in terms of people feeling overwhelmed by too many possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, very often there's a sense of being incredibly unhappy or unfulfilled or trapped in a place where we are at the moment. And then you ask someone, so where would you like to be instead? And one of two things tends to happen. Either the eyes get really wide and it becomes almost like deer in the headlights look. And as you can tell, it's just incredibly overwhelming. I don't know. Or eyes fall down. They, they, they close. And there's this sense of complete despair that says, I don't know. And I think what underlies both of those is fear. Mm-hmm. And I spend a lot of time in the book talking about how to take the fears that hold us back and to get really intimate with them, to lean into them and try to understand them so that we can begin to, you know, pick them apart a little bit, dismantle them, and um, in a way, move through them, move beyond them. But there's an, there's an interim step in there, and that is getting aligned with our values. And I know values is, is a word that we hear an awful lot. And trust me, a lot of the people that I talk with, it's like, oh no, not values again, please no more talk about values. But to me, that's the, that's a place we have to spend some time to get to know, not just the way we think, not just the way we feel, but who we really are. And understanding our values really gives us that path forward. And the important thing about values to that I remind people of is that they're not static. You know, we don't at age uh, 30 or 40 or 50, we're probably not living from the same set of values that we were when we were uh, 20, mm -hmm. right? They evolve, they should evolve as we do. Um, the alternative is, <laughs> the alternative is not good. Yes. Interesting. So do values help us tune us into our own energy to, because a lot of it is tuning back into yourself, right? And so how do you approach that with folks tuning back into themselves? Well, that's exactly it, Julie. It's all about guiding people, giving people the permission to listen to their deeper self. I think we have been, as a society, conditioned to listen from the time we are very small to all the other voices. Yeah. We're supposed to listen to what our parents say. We're supposed to listen to what our boss says. We're supposed to listen to what our, our, our spouse or our significant other has to say, or the church or the community, you name it. We're not taught by and large to listen to our souls. And so I think very often we get wrapped up in expectations. And I, I talk a lot about other people's expectations, right? Capital O, capital P. Other people's expectations really, <laughs> we can drown in those. They're very heavy, they're very sticky. And the way to get out of that trap from underneath that heavy wet blanket is to tune in to our own expectations of ourselves, but not just not the ego-based, mind-based expectations, right? The ones that 
the ones that come from that place of conditioning of, oh, but I should do this. I should want to do this. The, the work is to set that aside and to be very inquisitive and compassionate and curious with our soul and to ask, ask that place, what do I long for? What do I need? And then to feel empowered to pursue it. Yeah. So Becky, one of the things that we've been talking about on this podcast is the rise of the priestess, how women are being called to step into the spiritual community because the church has not made space for us and come into leadership roles and kind of just take that ourselves. Um, and so many women that I talk to pause in that decision because of the expectation or what their parents are gonna think or the expectation and what their spouse is gonna think or their in-laws. And you said it so well that we can drown in the expectations of other people. And what that drowning looks like is us not living the life that we were here to live. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. We don't live it. And then we're stuck in the life that we, that we're, you know, we're sort of settling for and we can't shake then this sense of, I, I call it the indigestion of shoulds, you know, when you just keep getting fed, you should do this, you should do this, you should want this, you should feel that. And you can just feel that indigestion rise up in the center of your body and it, you know, it's in your heart space and it hits your throat and then you feel it, this horrible taste in the back of your mouth. And finally, you just have to say, enough enough. It's like, you know, you, you can't take just one more should or else you're just going to, you're going to explode from that indigestion. Yeah. But when we can come back to our own deeper self, when we can answer the questions, how do you feel and what do you need? And believe not just that we have the, the agency to act on that, but that really, I, I believe we've got a spiritual mandate to act on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're not going to feel that fulfillment. We're not going to feel um, that peace and that ease and that consistent thread of joy within our lives until we're really in sync and following in alignment our soul's path here, our soul's plan. I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I feel like what you just described, you talk about that, that line of peace and ease and joy, you just described freedom. Mm. And that's really what this is all about. Learning to make choices from our soul in order to find freedom. So there was this movie that came out in november with jonah hill and his counselor it's called stutz or St i think it's called stutz s-t-u-t-z and he talks about how in life life is a series of one action step after another and us just keep putting one foot in front of another and they said the three things that you can really always count on within your life to show up is uncertainty, pain, and constant work. I'm going to repeat those. Um, uncertainty, pain, and constant work. And um, his counselor talked about it like this, like life is a strand of pearls. And that, that strand of pearls, your objective in life is just to be putting one pearl, and that pearl is an action step on your strand of pearls all the time. You're in that action step. And then once you get that one done, you put another one on. And he said that he expects in every single pearl and every single action step there to be a little bit of poo, right? Like a little <laughs> bit of pain or a little challenge or a little lesson to grow from. Mm -hmm. And I've said it on the podcast in different ways, but that is exactly what the angels show me. And I think that people get frustrated with hearing that life is pain 
uncertainty, and constant work. We are constantly looking for this magic pill. We are constantly looking for the shortcut. Well, you have just given me an excellent uh, movie review, so I'll be I'll be getting that one on Netflix next. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uncertainty, pain, and constant work. Yeah, I, th- what I've come to understand, and I've actually come to to take quite a bit of comfort in the idea that you know we talk about liminal space, that space between. Um, you know, it's what Nancy Levin called the space between no longer and not yet. It's what uh, Heather Plett, she she wrote a wonderful book about um, the art of holding space for other people. And it's all about liminal space. She describes it as that moment when the trapeze artist has let go of one bar and they don't yet know if they're going to catch the other bar. And we we tend to talk about that as a as a finite period of time it's going to have a distinct beginning and a distinct ending and sort of like we'll know it when we arrive there what i've realized and what i take comfort in is that this whole life is a journey of liminal space it the whole life is a journey of letting go of one bar and grabbing on to the next one we are constantly learning changing growing. I mean, it is the, it's the grit of life that yeah. shapes us. Mm-hmm. There is always going to be some degree of suffering. The question is, how do we, how do we show up for that? Friends, what if there was nothing stopping you from becoming abundant to the max in all things? finances, time, nothing was holding you back from becoming your healthiest, happiest, most financially abundant self yet. Friends, thanks to our annual and monthly angel members, we've been able to grant over $100,000 in partial scholarships so that souls who want access to life-changing teachings in the angel membership have that opportunity. And we have more partial scholarships to give. Don't let your egoic mind tell you that you're not worthy because the angels and I are here telling you, you are worthy. This is your year, but I can't help you get where you're going if I'm not working with you in one of my programs. Become an angel member now. Go to theangelmedium.com, then the angel membership tab to sign up. If you need a scholarship, let us help you. Scroll to the bottom of the Angel Membership page and click the link for partial scholarship options. Links are in the show notes. And thank you. Thank you for coming together as a community. Thank you for contributing what you can each month. And thank you for helping us reach hundreds of deserving souls with life-changing teachings in the Angel Membership this year. This is going to be your best year yet. And I love the way Eckhart Tolle explains it. You know, he's like, you can, you can argue against reality, but you'll be really unhappy if you'll suffer if you do. And so for me, where I, where I tend to go in that, in that discussion around, you know, constant work and uncertainty and constant pain is to yoga philosophy mm. and all of the nuggets of wisdom I've picked up over these two decades about simply letting go, letting go of expectation, letting go of comparison, letting go of the sense that, you know, uh, the sense of permanence and instead embracing acceptance and impermanence and that energy of, you know, an open palm, whatever comes, comes, whatever goes, goes. And we let it and we are fine. We are okay no matter what. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it is that acceptance. I guess my question and my purpose in bringing this up is, do you think that people stall out in making decisions and don't choose one decision over another or one choice over another because they don't want, like, 
like so many people want life to be different. Hey, Julie, I don't want that pain. I don't want that uncertainty. I don't want that constant work. I just want the easy life. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hold out and not make this decision over here because I'm waiting for this easy life to come, but it's Mm -hmm. not coming. (laughs) You have to take the action step. You have to make the decision. You have to put one foot in front of the other. You're so right. What I remind people, intention is one thing. Intention is wonderful. Um, Intention is part of manifesting, but intention without action is just wishful thinking, right? There is no, there is no plan that's going to get us from point A to all the way down to point Z, where we just get to leap over all the hard work as much as we might wish that were the case. But as you mentioned, if we can take just a series of small, deliberate, intentional steps in roughly the same direction, we're going to get where we're going. It may take time. There may be sacrifices. There may be periods of great discomfort, but it's a journey we have to be willing to make with grit, blood, sweat, tears in order to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Spirit says this all the time to the students in my angel Reiki school. Intention is the gasoline in the car. Um, But if you just think about gasoline alone, gasoline is just gasoline and it's just sitting there. Um, But the car itself is action. And so you combine that action with the gasoline that is intention and man, you could just move mountains. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Okay. So I want to move in a different direction, which is we've been talking about expectations and others' expectations of us and releasing those, but our expectations of ourselves. I've been tracking this over about the last six months and it never fails. I sit down on a Monday morning, I create a to-do list for my week and I'm, I'm actually not creating the to-do list for my week. That was a misspeak. Um, I'm creating my to-do list for that day, Monday. And it takes me all week to get done everything on my Monday list. And the purpose in this is the angels have been working with me and my spirit team um, to show me my expectations of myself are way, 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 way larger than what my physical capacity is to actually do. And if I can get done about 20% of what I think I can, does that mean that I need to reduce what I think I can do by 80%? (laughs) Uh, I'm down. (laughs) I'm down for that. I talk to, I, I am a recovering overachiever and I talk to people all the time that, you know, this, this idea of 110% effort is bunk. I would love to see us get really happy with everybody giving about 80% and leaving so much more time for reflection and connection and being in nature and simply being, simply being. I mean, our, our productivity culture tells us we've got to go and go and go and go. And we have, you mentioned, you know, what your physical capacity, uh, what, what that looks like. What about our emotional capacity? Mm -hmm. What about our spiritual capacity? We are, you know, these sweet little bags of bones and meat and skin running around on empty, Mm -hmm. but there's actually within us, within that, you know, that meat sack, there is this infinite supply of stardust. It is inherent in us. It is always there. And if we can connect to that energy source and cultivate that energy source and resupply and care for that energy source, we can do what's really important 
and begin to let the other things that aren't so important fall away. Yeah. And I think it, that comes from, you know, it, it, revisiting the idea of values. It comes from, it does stem from values and it hits on priorities, right? If values are our North Star, so to speak, you know, values are how we bring that to life. I'm sorry, priorities are how we bring that to life. So if you think of priorities as, as I think of it as currency, you know, we've all got a certain amount of, I don't mean financial currency, but time and energy and attention and intention. And if we can be a lot more mindful and deliberate about the way we spend all of that, and if we can do it in a way that is more aligned with our values, um, not only is the to-do list going to look different, how we feel when we you know, are knocking things off of the to-do list is going to feel different. Okay. So I am probably that recovering that has not recovered overachiever. <laughs> and like, I want to be picking up what you're putting down, but like, how does that actually work in real life? Well, all right, I'll okay, give you an I example. I get what you say in theory, but then sure. how do you actually like implement it? <laughs> I will give you an example from my life. So yeah. one of the soul guided choices I've made has been to put down alcohol. I okay. come from, you know, a, a, a family of alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic, his dad before him. And, you know, that was a trait that I brought forward into this generation. And so I'm coming up on nine years sober. I can value sobriety all that I want. You know, I can talk about it. I can, you know, I, I can make it part of my identity. I can say I'm committed to it, but unless I'm actually spending my time and my energy and my attention and my intention being sober, practicing sobriety, if I'm not doing that, it's just, it's empty words. That so is. our priorities are the way that we I mean, really priorities are how we practice being who we say we are. So if you're somebody who values peace in your life, you've got to actually prioritize that. Yes. And so does that mean, you know, what a priority by its very de definition is something that comes before something else. So if you prioritize peace, what are you going to do first? Um, I don't know, do the dishes perfectly or take 10 minutes and put your hand over your heart and breathe. Yeah. The yeah. dishes will get done. They mm -hmm. will. Yes. Perfect. I love that. That Thank you for going into that because that hits really deep. I love that. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, so your book is called You Are Not Stuck. And for those people who are at that point in their life where they're stuck right now, I don't know if you have any practice or just kind of demonstration that you do with them to kind of help them unstuck, unstick themselves. The practice that I do most often, that I recommend most often, is a body-based practice. It's yoga. <laughs> it really is. It wasn't in, you know, I was somebody, um, I was always very, very ambitious and driven and, uh, you know, productive. I was, well, I'll say it this way and this will explain it for, this will explain it. I skipped the first grade because I was, I was smart, right? So I talk about expectations of yourself, right? I was always going, striving, proving what to whom I have no idea, but I was trying to prove it. It wasn't until I got into about my mid twenties, I was going through a divorce and 
I had just moved into, I had moved back to my hometown of St. Louis. I moved into a little tiny apartment and it was just me. And this is going to, this is going to date me, but I, I put a, uh, uh, Oh my God, what do you even call it? A VHS tape into the VCR. It was a yoga, a yoga class. I didn't know what yoga was. I couldn't even touch my toes. But I put the tape in and there were, you know, the sounds of the Tibetan chimes and the sounds of breathing and, you know, teacher's really soothing voice. And I think in that moment, maybe for the first time, I got out of my head and into my body. And over the first few months of that practice, I learned how to breathe. That's it. I learned how to breathe. And that gave me an entirely new appreciation for this, you know, bag of bones <laughs> that I that I walk around in. And I developed a sense of loving myself that I'd never had before. Never. And I began to prioritize taking that time to simply be with myself and breathe. And, you know, over time I got to learn fun party tricks like, you know, doing a headstand or, <laughs> you know, putting my foot behind my head, which is of course not the point of the practice. The point of the practice is to yoke together this bag of bones with the spirit within us. And I think that's got to be the first fundamental step for getting out of our head and into our soul. I love this. And this is the entire reason that um, we created this year of my angel membership, um, which is all about somatic work and really coming into your physical body to hear yourself, to connect with yourself, to connect with the intuition that comes through the physical body. Um, oh, and you just explained that so incredibly well. So thank you. I, I love that. Um, okay, so let's go into this, uh, Becky. When chapter seven of your book, you talk about um, making decisions and what you need to be looking for when making those decisions, like trade-offs, consequences, boundaries. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Oh yes, I'd I'd love to talk about that. I am I am the child of two insurance agents. And so for me, this <laughs> this is the part about like risk management that um is really essential. But I think so often in our excitement to uh make a big change or make a big choice, it's like we 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 forget to pause and consider those things. So trade-offs and consequences. Um trade-offs and consequences have to be an essential part of what we think about. Otherwise, we are setting ourselves up for major failure. So it's another way of saying it, you know, we can't anticipate everything that might come along with making a particular choice. But if we can go in, you know, and having anticipated as many issues as we possibly can, we're going to have a much better chance of success. So to make that really tangible, I'll I'll give you an example. Um, about 10 years ago, when I decided to leave corporate America, uh, I remember calling my husband and, and saying, I, I had been on vacation in San Francisco with a couple of girlfriends and finally come to this, this realization after like five long years of hand wringing, like I'm ready to quit my job without a plan B, like I'm ready to walk in tomorrow and quit my job. And he said, okay, great. You know, let's, come on home. We'll sit down. We'll make a spreadsheet, <laughs> you know, and we'll talk about how we can make this work. And so I, I, I didn't want to wait for tomorrow. I really quickly wanted to start um, doing that calculus to figure out what's likely going to change and what can I live with? Mm -hmm. Right? So one example, you know, one thing that was going to change if I quit my job was that I was going to lose six figure, six figure income. Okay. But what does that really mean? Well, that means, um, probably not going to be able to take a vacation, probably going to have to like cut all the extras. So no more buying clothes, um, no more buying fancy shoes, might have to learn how to cook a lot more, 
you know, those are pretty surface ones, but, you know, bigger considerations like I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to contribute to my kid's college fund for a while. Um, I'm not going to be able to contribute to my own retirement fund. And then the question that I had to sit with was, am I willing to do that? If that was a deal breaker, I wasn't going to be able to leave my job. It was not a deal breaker. I was okay with deferring my, you know, long-term security for my immediate and near-term mental health. <laughs> yeah. But I was lucky. I was, you know, I was in a in a partnership with somebody who had a good job, right? So I had a little more flexibility to I, I wasn't choosing between working and eating. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why, that's why soul guided choices are so completely unique and individual. What works for one person may not at all, or may not work for another person may not even be possible for another person in this moment. Mm -hmm. And, but that's why we try to break down the big leap into those smaller digestible chunks that we can do, you know, one at a time, little incremental steps in the same direction to get there. I love it. I love it. I don't know if you've ever looked at this within your work. I'm ADHD and I think I jump, most people with ADHD jump and make the decision more quickly, right? Like, you see the decision that needs to be made, you just take action, you go do it. And I know how to get myself into that soul-based decision-making, but other people don't know that completely. Do you think that there is something to making decisions too fast if it's not soul-based? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. There are a lot of times when I have um leapt before looking at all of the possibilities um and i have learned from those experiences right we try to take them into the next one but i do find that when we when we drop down into that soul space and we believe <laughs> I, i'll show you that there's a tattoo on my arm I love it. Uh, I don't know if you can read it. It's Freud. It says, how bold one is when one is sure of being loved. Mm. How bold one is when one is sure of being loved. And to me, that means when I understand that I am held and I am safe, I'm held by something bigger than me. I love myself. I have the confidence to know that I'm going to be okay. Even if I make a mistake. Very few things can be un, can't be undone, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah. We can yeah. course correct as many times as we need to. Well, and that's the biggest energy is that <clears throat> some people put so much heavy weighted energy on this decision impacts the rest of my life. And if I get this decision wrong, then everything in my life is going to go sideways. And it's like, no, it's not. You go off and veer in a wrong direction. Spirit's just going to bring you back to where you need to be. Yeah. And, and I think that right there is the beauty of embracing the philosophy of impermanence. Mm -hmm. You know, impermanence kind of, it, it lets us write our story sometimes in pencil rather than ink. You know, yeah, I, I, this is, this might seem like a trite example, but it was very, it's very symbolic to me. I talk about other people's expectations. I always wanted a tattoo all throughout my twenties and my thirties. I wanted a tattoo and I didn't ever get one because I was afraid of what other people would think. I was afraid of what my bosses would think. I was afraid of what my mother would think. But it was because of the spirit of impermanence. This idea that th this is just my packaging, right? It's my soul that's infinite. 
this packaging, this is, this is going to go at some point. And how about enjoying the process of adorning it while it's here? And so when I was 40 years old, I got my first tattoo and then my second tattoo and then my third tattoo and the fourth is here and the fifth is back here. And it's all of these tattoos that are done in ink are a nod to impermanence. Isn't mm. that fun? Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it too, because I've always wanted to get a tattoo, but I've never done it. <laughs> Maybe that was your sign. Yes, I love it. And I just turned 40 this year. <laughs> um, awesome. I love you, Becky. You're just amazing. I love your book. I love your work. Um, you are not stuck. It is your book. It's out on bookshelves. Um, where can people find it and where can people find you? Oh, well, thank you for asking. Uh, probably the best way just across the board, I am, you are not stuck uh, everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, uh, you are not stuck .com. Um, The book actually comes out on January 3rd. Yeah, the book is available anywhere, anywhere you buy books. Yay. Thank you so much for being on the show, Becky. Thank you for having me. I just love your work, Julie. Thank you, friends. If you love today's conversation, if you know somebody who needs to make a big decision or is making a big choice, even a small choice in life, and they need to listen to this episode, um, go over to Instagram. You can use the post that I put up today and share it or tag your friends in it, but um, definitely let them know that this is a great podcast episode for them to listen to. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Beautiful soul, thank you so much for joining me today. My name's Julie. You know I'm all about connecting you with messages from your angels and loved ones on the other side. If you've been listening today and you're super excited and just have to know which angels are around you right now, who's connecting with you, and what messages they have for you, go to theangelmedium.com. Register for a session. You can do a reading with me or a member of my team, and we can help you in making sure that your angels are doing the very best they can to support you and guide you to your best life. If this sounds like you, virtual sessions, they're only offered on my website. Sign up today. And if you're the person who's really excited, you can sign up for my Angel Reiki School to become a certified angel messenger. That's for the healers among us who feel called to grow their intuition to the max and serve humanity with their gifts. You'll learn Reiki, mediumship, how to deliver angel messages, and how to get clients. That's the Angel Reiki School at theangelmedium.com or DM me on Instagram at Angel Podcast with any questions. Before you go, connect with your angels by placing your hands on your heart. Take a deep breath. Imagine a doorway filled with God's unconditional love is right in front of you. Step into that love and feel it as it fills your body, chakras, and auric field. Now ask your angels, what would you have me know today? And open yourself to the positive, loving messages they have just for you.